Welcome to The Economy Magazine at I-24 News, where we give you a daily view on world markets and the global economy. I'm Natalie Ehrlich. Coming up today, Tikkun Olam, a 72-hour makeathon creates tools for social change. And the Locker Commission proposes massive IDF budget cuts. Let's start now with the headlines. Well, the Greek stock market reopened on Monday, but in early trading, stocks opened down some 22.9 percent. The move is viewed as a positive step as the debt-stricken nation looks to continue towards stability. Well, the summer has sent Greece's economic system on the brink of collapse, with banks shut down and political ramblings between Athens and European creditors. Adding to Greece's problems, though, flash manufacturing PMI figures were down to 30.2 in July, the lowest reading since the market began compiling that data back in 1999. Nokia is said to be selling its Here Maps unit to a consortium of German car makers for some 2.8 billion euros. The move is a push to extend the reach of automakers in the driverless car revolution. Intelligent mapping systems are the basis in which self-driving cars are able to perform intelligent functions, like redirecting a vehicle in traffic. And German Commerce Bank reported on Monday its Q2 profit more than doubled, citing higher revenues and less taxes. Well, net profit came in at 280 million euros, compared with 100 million just a year earlier. Forecasts anticipated that figure would come at 245 million. Well, despite the blockbuster earnings report, the bank took a 100 million euro hit by the sale of unwanted commercial real estate, as well as shipping portfolios valued at more than 3 billion euros. And HSBC on Monday reported its Q2 profit fell 4 percent from the year earlier. The news follows recent bank overhauls that will cut up to $5 billion in annual cost by 2017. The British-based company, which has more than half of its businesses in earnings coming in from Asia, said in June that it was planning to shed 50,000 jobs and also spin off several underperforming units. Over the weekend, HBC also revealed plans to sell its entire Brazil business to Banco Bradesco for some $5.2 billion. Well, you may be familiar with hackathons. The term came up in the movie Facebook, helping propel the real-life company's early success. Meanwhile, in Israel, a team of innovators has applied that same concept to assistive technology. We are joined on set now by Sefi Atia, CTO at Tikkun Ola Makers. Thank you so much for being with us. So how did this first come about? Um, hi. So basically, um, we're a group of technologists working in an NGO, a think tank called the Root Institute. And um, Root Institute is all about closing gaps in society and using technology for um, bettering society. So. Us coming from a maker background, um, we thought about how to how to put this to use into the places in society that ben that benefit less, um, and that's kind of how it rolled out. Well, what do you mean by this maker background? So makers are is a general name for people that like to build stuff, um, and these are usually multidisciplinary people um, that you know. Uh, like to work with their hands using um, cutting edge technology using you know usually our early adopters so this is kind of this community all right and so you have people from all these disciplines engineering design all coming together to work and creating these assistive technologies yeah basically what we are doing is using open innovation um, and bringing people together to um, to bridge between uh, the needs and the talent so what we have is we have uh, two processes. One is a call for challenge and the other is a call for talent. And we ask people, what are your challenges? And then we ask people who wants to volunteer for the cause. And like you said, we bring together people from all disciplinaries to work together in order to solve a specific problem of a specific person. Well, you also have a promotional video that you've created that can help explain what you're doing to yeah. our viewers. Let's watch. with a walker. I can't walk without a walker. The problem occurred when I had to climb the stairs in order to get to a restroom on the upper floor and I didn't have the holder. So it was very, very difficult. 
they are creating a walker that I will be able to climb on stairs with nothing to hold on, just a walker. It's amazing. I can't lift, so that's why we are creating an idea that is taking a consideration of my disability in order to create the final solution. Well, tell us some of the prototypes that you've come up with that you're most impressed with. Um, so, basically, uh, we've had uh, three events so far and around somewhere between 40 to 50 different prototypes. Um, from them, I think what we saw just now actually is a really good example for, for innovation that wasn't, was, wasn't very expected. So, this team uh, that we just saw basically created a prototype for a walker that's able to walk on stairs, and, and this is a big problem. Stell, in this case, was the need knower. Um, and she represented the need. And this market with assistive technology has a lot of market failures. Um, and when putting together a team, a multidisciplinary team of very talented engineers, they managed to come up with a, con a new concept um, very fast within three days and to kind of rapid prototype it. Um, and and uh, now this team is working forward on making this into a product. Uh, we have other teams like, um, you know, uh, uh, smart crutches that have Bluetooth sensors in them. We have many, many other projects that um, work in the same methodology where you bring a need knower together um, and then you put a team around him and then they, they, they attempt to solve the problem really fast. And there's also this global aspect to your group as well. Yeah, basically we are focused on creating this methodology that is, being, is able to be replicated around the world. So we're looking to be kind of what TEDx is for inspiration, we want to be for problem solving. Um, and we are working with communities around the world in order to facilitate these events. So these have taken place already in Sao Paulo, and now we have, um, uh, we have an event coming up in San Francisco in the, in the Bay Area, together with Google.org, which is the philanthropic arm of Google. Um, and then next year we have a lot of locations coming up from Korea to Australia, um, Singapore, and other cool places. Um, and we're trying to both create the guidelines and the branding of how do you run this event, but also creating a network of global sponsors that want to take part in this and making it very, very easy for the local entrepreneur to put together an event like this. Well, thank you so much for coming on the program. So Lovely much. to have you here. Moving on now to the rest of our coverage, the Locker Commission published a 77-page report calling for massive sweeping budget cuts to the IDF. Israel's Defense Minister Moshe Yalon was quick to call that report unbalanced. And our reporter Shelby Weiner now takes a closer look. A bombshell was released last week. The Locker report on Israel's army budget has outraged many defense officials in the country. Chaired by the retired military secretary Yohanan Locker, the commission presents 53 proposals on reforming the military budget. Among them, shorter military service and lower pensions. For military professionals, the retirement age would rise from 50 to 55 years, and senior officials would lose out on profitable state subsidies. The objectives of the change, to reduce the size of the army by 11 percent within the next two years, and to reduce the overall budget allocated to officers by 14 percent. According to the report, 9.6 billion shekels could be saved by the end of 2020. The news has provoked indignation from Israel's defense minister. The report completely ignores the threats that surround us. It does not solve the security needs of the state of Israel and the security of its citizens. If executed, the Israeli Defense Force can no longer provide the current security. Because yes, security costs money. This is the fear surrounding the Locker Report. Can the IDF afford austerity measures while security threats continue to surround Israel? Correspondingly, the compensations offered to the military are justified based off the importance of their mission. While many criticize this report, others are voicing opinions in favor, like State Comptroller Yosef Shapira and journalist Ofer Shalach. The Locker Commission definitely takes the right direction. Numbers and timing are not always definitive, but there is no doubt that the IDF must reduce its workforce. It also should reduce its budget on pensions, pardons, and the number of professional soldiers. All of this should decrease. Another revolutionary proposal from the report. 
freeze the defense budget at 59 billion shekels for the next five years. The Army says it needs at least two to five billion more. The report also advocates for transparency between government departments. The lack of transparency and lack of trust greatly hinders the work between the different ministries. But this transparency would ignore the confidential nature of certain parts of the defense budget. And once again, Israel's security is invoked. The Army offered its own reorganization plan in response to the Locker Report. Nicknamed the Gideon Plan, it proposes much more modest reforms and does not change professional military pensions. Netanyahu now has a difficult choice to make. He must either go up against the IDF and the defense establishment or disavow the very commission he set up. The prime minister, though, holds on to a majority by the slimmest of margins, making it likely he will have to negotiate a compromise. On set now for analysis, we are joined by Amir Oren, defense correspondent at Hart's paper. Thank you very much for being with us today. What is the motivation behind these cuts? Well, the cuts are uh, only um, derivative. And when one looks at the 80-page report, and not only to a line here or a passage there, one sees a more complicated picture. First of all, what is a budget? In general, the uh, national budget, the government budget, it's a set of priorities, a set of constraints. I'm talking about the expenditure part, not the income side of uh, the budget. And the government has to set national priorities, one of which, perhaps the most important one for existence, is defense. Now, within the defense budget, you have the military budget, but you also have many other clauses. And the military, the Israeli Defense Forces, of course, tries to tackle the military part of the budget, even though in public discourse it all comes under the defense budget, but it is not. Now, one set of assumptions uh, which underlie the Locker Report is what is going to happen in the Middle East uh, over the next few years. And there and then it is outdated. It is even now outdated only uh, less than a month after it was published because the Vienna Agreement regarding the Iran nuclear effort uh, has now overtaken the defense assumptions regarding uh, an Iranian nuclear weapon effort. Um, on another front, the uh, cyber warfare um, systems that Israel now uh, is going to purchase and to put up, the sixth submarine which the government decided to purchase, even though the, the military did not need it. The, um, even uh, what the uh, firefighting uh, squadron, uh, which was set up after the Carmel fire five years ago, even that, the military didn't want. It was imposed on it by the government. So the military is saying to the government, listen, why don't you please, gentlemen, you are our superiors, please tell us what to do, then give us the means to do it, and then we'll try to see whether one side of the ledger complies with the other one. So you're actually saying that the military is very good at budgeting here? The military um, is uh, very good at uh, saluting, obeying, and then executing. It doesn't want to tell the government what to do, but it does want the government uh, to be coherent in what it tells it, the military, doesn't want the government to tell the military, listen, why don't you defend all of our territories 24-7? Uh, we don't want any terror act uh, to succeed, but then not uh, fund the readiness uh, needed for it. So the, the military, under Lieutenant General Gadi Eisenkot, the uh, new chief of staff, who is uh, very focused on uh, what needs to be done, um, he is a very dedicated public servant. Um, it is not really correct. The report mentioned that um, uh, Eisenkot came up with the Gideon plan uh, as against the Locker report. Uh, it had nothing to do with it. The military needs a multi-year plan in order 
to uh, be ready for any challenge and not waste money um, buying from one year to the next and then canceling contracts and, and paying the contractor and, and all of that. Um, so while public uh, comments uh, focused on, on pensions and the like, this is not really the issue. And even with pensions, the question is, how is the military going to keep the best manpower it can when other services, such as Shabak or Mossad or the police, are vying for the very same quality manpower? If people go to the Shabak and get a higher pension from the military, obviously they will drift off from the military to Shabak or Mossad or to a high-tech uh, company, and the military will not be able to keep new blood and the best of Israel's youth within its ranks. So it's not really shekels and dollars and cents. I see. All right. Well, just tell us real briefly who is Locker for some of our international viewers. Major General uh, Yohanan Locker retired oh. was one well, of Well, that the unfortunately wraps up our program, but we'd love to have you here another time. Thank you again very much for watching. And join us again at the Jaffa Port every day. I'm Natalie Ehrlich.